music. Uh, so very, very strict control over um, what's going on in Germany. So this is what happens when you have this kind of dictatorship. This is what happens when you have complete control um, of everything, everything that is going on in the uh, country. Any questions before we move on? Any questions about anything we've discussed so far? Yes, it says Carol, but that's Mark. <laughs> Don't forget to unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute, can't hear. Yeah, there we are. Um, just I wanted to go back a little tiny bit. I visited Dachau about six years ago, and something that's worth noting, it was, as you mentioned, Tim, a work camp. It was also a place uh, where there was a lot of medical experimentation going on. Yes. Um, and just in order to be prepared, there were, in fact, gas, gas chambers there. Mm -hmm. uh, worth, worth, worth noting. Yes, it's interesting because some of what started as concentration force labor camps were then later outfitted uh, down the road for the idea of ultimately murder, clearly. You know, even if they did not start that way, uh, later on as the plans began to solidify, as you're going to see, um, they realized that they were going to need some sort of way of outfitting them that, you know, mass murder could be carried out as well. Um, my brother did a year of study in, in Munich, Germany, um, and actually stayed in a, with a family. This was when he was in high school. And he actually asked them, he says, you know, can we take a trip, you know, out to Dachau to, to see? Um, and um, the family was incensed that he wanted to see it. Now, the, Germany has come a long way in their reckoning with the Holocaust. But this was a, a little bit before that had really really happened and they were really quite angry that he had even made the request to go to Dachau. They did not want to take him. Uh, ultimately he did get there and, and he did see it, but he said it was, yeah, it was kind of interesting at that point. So anyway, all right, let's move on. Let's talk about Nazi racial theories um, because clearly this is going to play into the idea of genocide and into the idea of extermination. Uh, before we get started into a few things, first of all, you uh, one thing I want you to know is that Adolf Hitler really admired, he did not admire much about the United States of America and our democracy. He did admire, however, the Jim Crow laws of the South. He was a great admirer of the whole notion of segregation, the whole notion of separate but equal, and everything that Jim Crow and those laws stood for. Um, it was something that he looked at and it was something that he had a great admiration for. The other thing that Hitler was very big on was what at the time was called the science of eugenics. Now eugenics has now in modern times and has been completely discredited as a scientific theory. But at one time, and the man's name was Sir Francis Galton, was the man who came up with this idea of eugenics. And you don't really need to remember him because he's not really that important. But this eugenics, simply put, is an attempt to control um, reproduction, an attempt to control reproduction so that the only thing that's being reproduced are people with the desirable characteristics that you want them to have a way of getting rid of those characteristics that are undesirable. Um, and so that was um, the idea of eugenics. And this is clearly something that plays into Hitler's racial theories. So this all gets us into the Aryan master race. Hitler's idea was that there was this master race and it was their job, their job, to dominate the world, not just Germany. Ultimately, this was gonna go beyond Germany. This was going to go to 100% complete world domination. Um, there was going to be no more impurities into the master Aryan race. And you all know that this was the sort of fair haired, blonde haired, blue eyed, light complexion sort of, um, master race, which interestingly enough, I always find Hitler didn't fit that himself. 
but n- never mind on that. Um, but that was what he considered to be everybody in the world needed to be a part of this master race. Now, this, of course, were the traditionally Germanic peoples, uh, would also include the Scandinavians, um, the Danes, uh, those people uh, certainly sort of fit pretty much the, the, the prototype of the master race. It did not include ethnic groups like Slavic peoples um, in you know, Czechoslovakia, in Poland, in the Ukraine, in Russia. Uh, they were clearly uh, inferior. It did not include any people of color. Um, were there African Americans living in Germany at this time? Yes, there were. Not many, but there were some. Um, so uh, they were not going to certainly be included in this master race. And of course, Jews. Jews were no part of the master race at all. So it was all about this, this blue-eyed, blonde-haired, you know, strong, physically strong. Um, if you've ever seen some of the propaganda from the Nazis, you see these pictures of young boys and young uh, girls and they're physically working out and running and doing these things to make them strong because that's what they were, they were going to dominate the world. These were going to be the people who ultimately were going to be in control and they were going to be in control of everything. So part of Hitler's goal was get rid of all the impurities, get rid of all the impure races. And first and foremost, he was going to target Jews. But it wasn't ever intended to end there. All right. So what were some other things that helped him along on this path? Uh, he began a program of forced sterilization. Uh, This was very early on in 1933. So he wasn't going to wait around. Uh, Very shortly after assuming the complete control of the government in 1933, um, anybody who was determined to be either genetically inferior or physically inferior was going to be sterilized. Why? So that they could not reproduce. This is eugenics. They cannot reproduce. We do not want genetically inferior people. They may be weak and we need them to be strong. We do not want physically inferior people because we need everybody to be this Aryan master race. And if you were somehow not perfect, well, then you disrupted the idea of the Aryan master race who were all strong and healthy and ready to go. And so we'll, we will sterilize them and therefore they cannot reproduce. Now, at this point, we were not killing them. We were not murdering them yet, but we were simply going to make sure that they would not be able to have children of their own. So for sterilization, as I said, this starts uh, early in 1933. Um, In terms of the Jews as a race, um, looking at racial theory of the Jews as a race, Hitler determined that they were poisonous. The Jews were poisonous. Yes, Andrea, question. Um, Obviously, we know they sterilized the women, but... What about the men? I've never, I've always heard about the sterilizations for women, but how would they sterilize a man or did I they just know. do the women? And I, interestingly enough, I don't really know the answer to that because I never really considered it, but I don't know if they did some form of vasectomy maybe early on, but yeah. something, um, or there were also ways, castration perhaps. That's what Mark said, if they oh. went that far. And, and there were far. cases, we know there yeah. were cases of castration as well. Sam, I just read today, I just yeah. read today, um, castration was one of the tools I did use. Okay. That makes more sense. I didn't think they'd have the technology for a vasectomy. So yeah, they probably didn't have it, but castration certainly. Um, wow. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So yes. And the Jews, of course. Yes, Maury. Um, perhaps you're going to touch on this, but it, it think uh, did Hitler's thinking, if you could call it that, <laughs> evolved toward a final solution or in, in other words in the 30s was Hitler did, did Hitler indicate whether ultimately he hoped to go to extermination or was it initially simply a master race uh, controlling Jews and others um, that were he, felt to be inferior good question in Mein Kampf 
there are clearly suggestions that point toward the idea of ultimately elimination, which would be extermination of those who did not fit the master race. Um, but he, Hitler himself was smart enough, or at least the people around him were smart enough to know you can't move into that right away. Just as he took his time getting complete control of the government, Hitler realized he was going to have to take some time to get the propaganda out there, have people buy into the idea, and then ultimately take step toward the ultimate goal of what would become genocide. So the one thing he, 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 he and again, I don't know if it was him or the people around him who were advising him, probably a little bit of both, realized that this had to be sort of done in a step-by-step -step systematic way, which in a way makes it even that much more sinister, that you know you're going toward an ultimate goal and you're just sort of back there wringing your hands and biding your time, knowing where you're going and figuring, figuring out some of the most sinister ways to get there. I mean, really, when you think about it, it's really kind of frightening. Um, but that seems to be what was what was going on. Um, anyway, so Hitler believed in terms of the Jewish people that the only thing the Jews did was they lived off other races. They had nothing to contribute on their own. They had nothing to contribute to society. They lived off other races and by living off the other races, they weakened them. And so they need to be dealt with. Now, I don't know how Hitler explained the fact that so many Nobel Prizes had been won by German Jews and other advancements in science and the arts and whatever had been under the auspices of many German Jewish people. I guess he just simply sort of forgot about all of that because his idea was they contributed nothing. The Jews merely, merely mooch off of society. They take, they take, they take, they don't contribute, they don't offer, and therefore they weaken our, the fabric of our society. And so the only thing we can do is ultimately we have to do away with them. We have to get them out from among us, get them away from us. So that was his theory on the Jews. Um, now, the other problem that we have here too is of course there are people as we know among us who suffer from diseases that are not necessarily physical. We have diseases that are, you know, diseases of the mind, emotional diseases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they clearly could not be a part of the master race. So another part of Hitler's plan was to send, set up mental hospitals or sanitariums where those who were suffering from emotional diseases, mental diseases um, could be, and I'm air quotes here, cared for, cared for. These people were ultimately going to be executed, executed. They had to be done away with. Um, and he even included in this mentally ill people who were Aryan. If they were Aryans, but they had some form of mental illness, they had some form of emotional illness, um, they too, they were defying the idea of the master race because the master race doesn't get emotionally sick. It doesn't get mentally sick. Included in this were things like epilepsy was included. Um, acute alcoholism was, in, was included in this, as well as other you know, mental disorders, emotional disorders. Um, there were six different sanitariums set up throughout Germany. And um, it, was, it was a great ruse. The families would be told that, well, we're going to send them away for care in a sanitarium where they will have the best care that the Nazi government can provide them. Um, they will be, you know, we have nurses on staff, we have doctors. They would be shown pictures of these buildings with beautiful grounds and benches and, and, and green grass and ponds and whatever. And, um, Several months later, a letter would come from the sanitarium signed officially by a doctor saying, well, we, we regret to inform you that so-and-so, your daughter, your son, your, your brother, your sister, whoever, um, did not respond well to treatment, took a turn for the worse and has died, has died. And we will take up the expense of burying them for you. It was, it was in a way, it was this brilliant ruse. And so they managed to, uh, it, it was a program that was done under strict secrecy. 
This was not something that the government wanted to get out. They actually called it the T4 program. That was like the secret code name, the, the T4 program. Um, and if memory serves me correctly, about 75,000 people were euthanized under this program, about 75,000. Ultimately, and, and I think this proves something very interesting as well, the Nazi government stopped this program. The T4 program was halted, just stopped. Why? Word of the program leaked. Somebody spoke to somebody, talked to somebody, and word got out. And it was the Christian clergy in Germany who were horrified by this program horrified by what the Nazi government was doing under this T4 program. And they spoke up and they made it very clear that this was something that they could not condone, that they could not go along with. They raised such a strong voice that the Nazi government backed off and shut the program down. What I find interesting here is it proves that these people, these clergy, priests, ministers, whoever they were, had enough authority to get something shut down if they felt that it was morally, morally repulsive. Where would they be a few years from now? Where would their voices be a few years from now? They proved they had power. They proved they could get something changed. They proved they could get something stopped. And a few years later, where will they be? Where will those voices be? There will be a few, but there will not be many. Crying out again when people start to understand what is happening when the Jewish neighbors in their city, their town or whatever, are all of a sudden being taken away. Where will those voices be? Where will the, the, the ministers and priests in the pulpits? I don't know. It's just something to think about because they, they stopped, they stopped the program. Hitler did not want the priests, the clergy angry at him. He simply couldn't. So it was, the program was just simply halted, no more, done. And it was never picked back up. So I just thought that was something very interesting to kind of throw out there. Um, any questions about anything with the racial theory and the perfect Aryan superhuman kind of thing, the Ubermensch, as they would call it. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention in this too is that um, young German women who were the perfect blonde haired, blue eyed, you know, ideal uh, German young woman uh, were, were actually paid to have children. You were paid to have children because they needed more to populate with the super race. So they had this Lebensborn program where you could woman, a woman could go into it. She would have a child. She would be, you know, uh, paired up with someone. They would have a child and the government would take it and raise it and take control. All of her medical expenses were cared for and she was given payment to do her part for the country because she was doing something good for greater oh, you can see me. Yeah. Question, yes. Yes, to actually two. Yes. One is when was the mental program stopped? And two, in light of the master race theory, what did they think of uh, Italians and Greeks and people from Southern Europe who probably didn't fit the profile? Good questions. Um, the, pro the T4 program lasted about two, two and a half years. Uh, sometime in 1935 is when it was halted. Started in 33, sometime in 1935. I don't have an exact date, but it was about a two, two and a half year program. Uh, your question about Greeks, Italians, those of you know, Southern European descent. Well, as we know, there is going to be um, a, an alliance between Mussolini in Italy and Hitler during the war. Um, but Hitler was not averse. He was not averse to using people for his own gain. And so I'll sign a treaty and I'll work with the Italians, but even they were considered to be inferior. Maybe not to the point where we need to exterminate them, but they were still considered inferior to the master race. Now, 
let's just say that at some point Hitler had achieved world domination. You know, remember he called his third Reich the thousand year Reich, you know, it lasted what about 17 or maybe not even that 13 years, whatever. So he was a little off, his math was a little off, but let's assume he got world domination. Would he have ultimately taken all these other groups of people and done the same thing? I don't know, I don't know. I really can't answer that question, but I'm glad we don't have an answer to that question. I'm glad it never happened, but everyone else was considered inferior to the master race regardless. But I will use you, I will use you as an alliance, as an ally to get what I need or what I want from you. And then later on, if I have to do away with you, I'll do away with you. Anything else before we move on? I just want to say, I, I'm, I first heard of the Hitler youth. I met a friend of my brother's in prison when he was 17. And he said his mother was a member of the Hitler youth and he grew up that way. And that's the first I ever heard of it. Yes, Hitler was, uh, he wanted to get them early, you know, indoctrination. You know, children, you know, when you get them when they're young and you start to put these ideas into their heads, you know, the famous quote, if you tell a lie big enough and long enough, people will believe it, will start when they're very young. And if they don't know anything else, if this is all they've ever known, why would they not buy into the program, you know? So, I mean, he had it starting from the time they were literally able to walk, you know, and all the way on up through school. So, yeah, interesting. All right, so let's talk about what was going on then now with the Jews in Germany, the actions that Hitler was gonna be taking now against the Jews. Um, Cause clearly, as he said, they were poison and they needed, they were first on the list of those that he felt needed to be, to be dealt with. So first thing was on April 1st, 1933. So again, we're back early on here. Um, Hitler ordered uh, from the government, the central government in Germany, a boycott. It was a mandated boycott of all Jewish owned businesses. So a one day boycott, do not buy from any stores that are owned by Jews. And a lot of the merchants were Jewish. A lot of the different you know, merchants in the, in the country were Jewish owned stores. So don't buy from Jews, period. Just don't do it for one day. Let's just prove we don't need them. Let's prove we can get along without them. Let's just show the power. Remember, Jews were less than 1% of the population in Germany. But nonetheless, you know, they were, you know, merchants and they were central to the economy of Germany, um, which had just come through the Great Depression, was now starting to get back on its feet. And I'm going to tell you, honestly, there were a lot of people in Germany who thought this was really stupid. Just the common people in Germany said, why should we do that? You know, these are people we buy from. We've been buying from them. We, we, we go to their grocery store. We buy our clothing. We get these things. So this was, though it was mandated by the government and, you know, the strict eyes of the, the Nazi hierarchy were watching. Um, there were a lot of the people in Germany at this point that said, oh, that's just stupid. That's just stupid. We're going to shop where we want to shop. We're going to go where we want to go. Um, so it wasn't a highly successful program, although some people who did not want to risk the wrath uh, of the powers that be, of course, went along with it. So that's April 1st, a one day boycott of Jewish businesses. April 7th of 1933. So a week later, uh, a mandate comes down from the government. Jews are now restricted from any sort of civil service jobs. So Jews cannot hold jobs in the civil service any longer. They cannot hold any government jobs any longer. Um, and they cannot be teachers or professors any longer, except to other Jewish students. They can teach their own, but in the universities and in the public school systems, et cetera, they cannot be teachers, they cannot be professors. They cannot have any civil service jobs, such as you know, working in fire departments and um, uh, say even road crews and even uh, police and whatever. So anybody who was any Jewish person who was in any of those professions, careers, whatever, uh, now they're out, they are out. So all of these people lost their livelihoods. So, okay, the boycott might not be successful, but now we'll take your job away from you. And of course, this was going to open jobs up for Aryan Germans um, who deserve them, who deserve them. Okay, so April 7th, one week later on April 14th, 
Jewish lawyers, Jewish doctors may no longer practice except for other Jews. So Jewish doctors cannot treat non-Jewish patients any longer. Jewish lawyers cannot represent non-Jewish uh, litigants in a court. They could only represent Jews or they could only medically treat Jews. That was it, which of course, of course was going to put you know, quite a bit of dent in their ability to make a living. Um, but why would you want, you know, why would a, a good Aryan want some sort of poisonous Jew to, you know, give their sort of medical advice and medical opinion or their legal advice, their legal opinion in a court of law? So we're gradually seeing Jews and their professions and their jobs and whatever being removed from the mainstream of society. Yeah, work with your own people, teach your own people, treat your own people medically, et cetera, whatever. Represent your own people in court until that will be taken away too. But you're not gonna do anything for um, non-Jews. It's simply, simply going to stop. So then we get to the Nuremberg Laws. The Nuremberg Laws of 1934. Now Nuremberg is the city that was the site of the largest Nazi party rallies. Even though Berlin was the capital of Germany, Hitler had a real affinity for the city of Nuremberg and he held the largest number of his uh, big uh, party rallies in the city of Nuremberg. And a lot of what he decreed was decreed from Nuremberg. So we have these Nuremberg laws. What did the Nuremberg laws say or what did they do? First of all, it stripped all German Jews of citizenship. That's number one. So German Jews are no longer citizens of Germany. They've had their citizenship denied them. He said, they're going to be subjects. They will be subjects of the state, but they're not citizens any longer. So take away the citizens. And remember, many of these people had long histories in Germany. They had fought valiantly for Germany or members of their family had fought valiantly for Germany in World War I. They had contributed greatly to German culture and society and whatever, but now they could not be citizens of the nation that they had been a part of in some cases for hundreds of years. The Nuremberg laws also outlawed marriages between Jews and non-Jews. So those were completely forbidden. Jews could not marry non-Jews and no non-Jew should ever want to marry a Jew, God forbid. But even if that would come to be, they are now outlawed. There can be no marriages between Jews and non-Jews. Since Jews are no longer citizens, of course, they no longer have a right to vote. Not that there was anything to vote for anyway, because it would only be a Nazi party slate of candidates, but nonetheless, but even on, on issues locally, you know, that might govern a city or a town, their Jews just couldn't vote, period. They had no say so anymore in anything. Um, some of the laws would restrict Jews from being, a go being allowed to go to theaters. They could no longer go to a theater. They could no longer go to a cinema. They could no longer go to a park. They could no longer go to an art museum. They were no longer welcome at public swimming pools. And they were placed under curfew. Curfews were set, which allowed Jews to be on the streets only between certain hours. So life began to become very, very restricted for anybody who was Jewish in Germany. I mean, things that we so much take for granted, well, not so much with COVID right now, but you know, we wanna go to a movie, we go to a movie. You know, you wanna go take a walk in the park, you go take a walk in the park. You know, you wanna go see an exhibit at an art museum, you go see an exhibit at an art museum. All of those things, much of which make life pleasant, you know, part of how people entertain themselves were being denied to the Jews. Um, that just even the times that you could leave your house, even the times that you can leave your home um, are being restricted. So, and there would be more of these laws. Those were just some examples. Um, further down the road, Jews would not be allowed to have bicycles. 
They certainly, they were not allowed to ride the public transportation, the streetcars, the buses, whatever. Uh, they would have to turn in their driver's licenses uh, to, to the state. Um, Jews were forbidden from having pets. Pets were denied them. I mean, these were laws that were passed. You cannot have these things in your life. You know, all again, so much of things that we take for granted were just one by one taken away. Um, I saw a poster one time with the Nuremberg laws listed year by year. And this thing was huge. There were hundreds of these things. They thought of everything. Oh, take away that. Oh, take away that. Oh, they, we can't have them have that either. It's like somebody must have sat in a room at some point and thought, hmm, what else makes life fun? Oh, well, let's take that away too. I mean, it's, it's almost like it, it boggles my mind that somebody had the time to think of all of these things and to say, well, these people can't have them. But that's exactly what was happening. They were being denied the simple joys, the simple pleasures, the simple freedoms of everyday life, you know, that so many of us take for granted. So life was getting very, very challenging um, for the Jews of Germany. And then we get to 1936 and Hitler gets to host the Berlin Olympics, interestingly enough. So the world is coming to Berlin. The whole world is coming to Berlin. And of course, this is a chance for Hitler to show off how great Germany is, to show off how he has been able to turn Germany around with its economy, um, make it into a world power again. Um, so he's using the Olympics in Berlin as his kind of like show place to the world. You're coming to my country, you're coming to my capital, and I'm gonna show you what I've been able to do in my first, you know, three, three and a half years of dictatorship. Now, again, Hitler was smart. He knew they were going to be, the press was going to be there, you know, covering the Olympic games, athletes and dignitaries from all over the world were going to be in Berlin. And he really wanted Berlin to shine. So for the duration of the Berlin Olympics, all of the anti-Jewish signs were taken down. All of the signs that said Jews forbidden, Jews not wanted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of them disappeared. They're all gone. There's no vestige of anything that looks anti-Jewish. Because Hitler was smart enough to know that probably really wasn't going to show the best picture of Germany. And of course, you all know the story of uh, the great US athlete Jesse Owens at the 1936 Olympics. You know, Hitler wanted this also to be the Aryan race is going to win gold medal after gold medal after gold medal. And again, we're going to show that, you know, our master race theory. And what we're doing here is dominant. You know, we're just gonna show up the rest of the world. And so our great track star, Jesse Owens, comes over from the United States. Oh, and before I finish the story, which you mostly all know, um, Hitler had had an agreement with the International Olympic Committee that he would be the one who would be allowed to present the gold medals all the gold medals to all the gold medal winners. Hitler was gonna be up there at the podium being able to present the gold medals. Cause of course that was gonna be a moment of glory for him, you know, on the world stage. So here comes Jesse Owens, you know, great track star that he is, African-American athlete representing the United States in the 36 Olympics. And of course we all know, you know, runs away with track and field events. And of course takes the gold medal beating you know, the contestants, Aryan contestants from Germany. Well, Hitler stormed out of the, uh, the uh, stadium in anger. And so Hitler, who wanted to give all the gold medals, did not present that gold medal to Jesse Owens because he couldn't stand the idea, first of all, that an American, let alone an African-American of color here, defeated his master race summarily in track and field. So, you know, just a, a kind of, you know, something that didn't quite go the way that Hitler wanted. So what, the Olympics last a couple of weeks. So for a couple of weeks, everything in Berlin is relaxed. 
everything in Berlin looks good. People can go back to their home countries and say, you know, we've heard these rumors about things in Germany and, you know, what's going on. But, uh, you know, we were there and, you know, it looks pretty good. It looks like, you know, life in Berlin is, uh, you know, going pretty well. It looks like, you know, Adolf Hitler's doing a pretty good job of bringing Germany around, which is exactly what, you know, Hitler wanted. So Germany was given favorable press coverage overall during the Olympics. Of course, as soon as the international representation, the press are all gone, the athletes have all returned to their home nations, you know, everything goes back to the way that it was. But for a couple of weeks there, everything looked a lot better, it looked you know, more like a normal sort of thing. All right, and then 1937, 38, as we get closer and closer to the dawn of World War II, um, some other things happened. And then of course, we're going to get to Kristallnacht. Um, now, every single Jewish business in Germany by 1937, 1938 had to be Aryanized. Everything had to be in the hands of Aryans. There could be nothing in the hands of Jewish managers, Jewish people in any way, Jewish accountants, everything had to be Aryanized. So the Jews were pushed out of business completely, just completely and utterly, they're out, they're gone. Um, Hitler, um, everybody in Germany was required, everybody was required to carry an ID card. Jewish ID cards had to be stamped with a big red J. So if you presented your ID card to anybody for any reason on official means or unofficial means or whatever, it was clear without even having to read a word on it that you were Jewish. So you had your, your big red J on your ID card. And also, and I find this interesting, any Jewish person living in Germany who did not have a quote, Jewish sounding name. In other words, they looked at your name and they couldn't tell that it was Jewish just by the way it looked or the way it sounded, was required. If you were a man, you, had to, you were required to add the name Israel to your name as a middle name. It was required, this wasn't a choice. So that clearly your official name would be obviously Jewish. If you were a woman and did not have a traditionally Jewish sounding name, you had to name, you had to add Sarah as part of your middle name. So every Jewish male had to have Israel added and every Jewish female had to have Sarah added to their names. So that even by name, merely by name, that you could be clearly identified as someone who was Jewish, let alone the big red J that was stamped on your ID card as well. So, you know, things just keep getting more and more difficult for the Jews in Germany. Now, as a side note, before we get to Kristallnacht, which of course is extremely important, um, what was Hitler's attitude if, if Jews wanted to leave Germany during this time, during the mid, early to mid thirties? Um, his attitude was go, get out of here. We don't want you, go, leave, leave. But there would, we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, but he wasn't really trying to keep them there. He didn't want them. So if you can get out, go. And some did, I mean, there were some who did, you know, so I guess they would be the lucky, the fortunate who were able to get out. Um, the, the reins were not so tight now that nobody could get out yet. That would happen, but not yet. So if you can get out of here, go. We don't want you here anyway. So one less we have to think about, worry about, so go. So I just wanted to bring that up. So there, there was a sort of you know, exodus for those who could get out of, of Germany. All right, any questions before we get to Kristallnacht? Okay, Kristallnacht, which we just had the anniversary of just you know, a week or so ago. Um, Night of Broken Glass is also the name given to it to, you know, uh, all the, the windows that were shattered with gl the glass glittering in the streets and the sun on the, the next morning. So Kristallnacht, Crystal Night, or Night of Broken Glass, um, November 9th, from the night of November 9th through the early morning hours of November 10th of 1938. Hitler now felt confident enough that he could do something on a grander scale. 
and see what was going to happen and see what the reaction was going to be. But he needed to have a reason. He just couldn't do it out of the clear blue. And luckily something happened that would give Hitler the excuse, as I call it, for Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass. Um, Hitler had just recently expelled all of the Jews who had been born in Poland. There were some Polish born Jews living in Germany and he expelled them out of the country, put them on a train and sent them across the border back into Poland and just dumped them across the border. Just let them off the train and figure it out. Figure it out. Didn't try to help them, just you're out of here. You are not German citizens. You do not have German citizenship papers. You are Polish citizens. You were born in Poland. So get out, just get out. Well, a young teenager, 17 years old, found out what had happened to his parents. He happened to be living in Paris at the time, this young man. His name is Herschel Greenspan, not really important, but he was a 17 year old Polish Jewish teenager living in Paris. And he found out what had happened to his parents and his parents had been shunted across the border and left with nowhere to go. And he was impulsive and he was angry. He walked into the German embassy in Paris, pulled out a gun and shot a Nazi official in the embassy, whose name was Ernst von Roth. Again, name not so really important. He shot him in his anger over what had happened to his Polish born parents. Well, clearly he was there. I mean, there was no denying what he had done. I mean, they were able to you know, apprehend him immediately. And history does not know what happened to this man. If you're gonna ask, well, what happened to him? We don't know what happened to poor Herschel Greenspan. Uh, we really don't. But he would play an important part in history because this was the excuse Hitler needed for to do something big, something on a national, more grand scale. So he said, um, we're going to make it look like this has inflamed the anger of the German people. This murder of a Nazi official in Paris at the embassy has made the people so angry that they're going to riot in the streets. We're gonna, they're just gonna, spontaneous. He wanted it to look spontaneous. Oh, it's not spontaneous. It's very well planned, but he wanted it to look spontaneous. He wanted it to look like this was the spontaneous anger of the German people angry over the murder of one of their officials in Paris. And they're going to take to the streets and they're going to do something about it. They're going to do something about it. Now, again, to show how well planned it was, there were telegram and telegraph messages going back and forth all over Germany, some of which after the war were actually found and allies got copies of. Um, the order went out, when you go out to do this, do not wear your uniforms. Do not wear your Nazi uniforms. Do not carry the swastika flag. Um, just wear regular street clothes. Just, you know, look like an average citizen on the street. Do not look like an obvious Nazi party member. We don't want that. Orders went out as well to the police departments, to the, fire, to the fire departments in all the cities. You are not to interfere. You are not to intervene. You are not to stop anything that is happening. You can stand, you can watch, you can observe, but do not get involved. Do not stop it. Do not try to squelch it. Do not put out fires that may start. Just stand back and watch. So no uniforms, look just like average people on the streets. Nothing that indicates that this is planned. This is just some action by people who are upset and it's going to turn into a nationwide city by city, town by town pogrom, a rise up of action against the Jews. 
And so on that night in the streets, all kinds of pandemonium. So what was the damage? What did happen exactly that night? 250 synagogues in Germany were destroyed. 250, most of them burned to the ground. Most of them destroyed by fire, set on fire and burned. Um, 7,000 businesses that were Jewish businesses were looted and trashed. And this is the breaking windows that you can see in the pictures sometimes of Kristallnacht. Um, cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries were desecrated. Um, Jewish schools, because remember, teachers could still teach their own students, so there were Jewish schools. Uh, the Jewish schools were attacked, ransacked, and again, destroyed. Jewish homes were broken into. Jewish hospitals were destroyed. They were vandalized. Torah scrolls were ripped, desecrated on the streets, and in some cases, urinated upon. So there is this, this massive amount of destruction, of violence against anything that was Jewish owned, anything that belonged in any way to the Jewish community, and also against people. People were beaten on the streets. So there was bloodshed, uh, there was violence. People were dragged out of their homes and beaten. It was a horrif horrific scene, it's horrific. And this went on through the night into the early morning hours as police stood and watched, as firefighters watched synagogues that were burning to the ground and did nothing to stop it. And the average person in Germany who was not Jewish may not have participated in this. We don't know what everybody did. People, some people were probably so frightened, they locked their doors and stayed in, just didn't wanna see it, didn't wanna be a part of it. And there may have been some who actively took part as well, but we have no way of knowing that. In that period overnight, 30,000 Jewish men, 30,000 Jewish men were arrested, imprisoned and sent to various concentration camps. So the next morning, people were waking up to massive scenes of vandalism, of destruction, of fires still burning out, smoke in the air. And nobody could deny that something pretty horrific had happened and it had happened to the Jewish community in Germany. Um, and, and if that's not bad enough, the Nazi officials, in looking at the damage in Germany, pointed the finger at the Jewish community of Germany and said, you know what? This is all your fault. It's your fault. You are going to take the blame for this. And so you are going to be fined. And you are going to pay fines to repair the damage that's been done. The fine that was levied against the Jewish community of Germany was um, 1 billion, 1 billion Reichsmark. Reichsmark was the money in Germany. 1 billion Reichsmark, which would equal $400 million. That was the restitution that the German Jewish community was going to have to pay. And they said on top of that, you have to clean up the mess. You're gonna come out and you're gonna clean the streets and you're gonna make sure that all of this is cleaned up and you're gonna make the repairs to the buildings because it's your fault. You did this. And so since you did it, you're gonna pay the price, you're gonna clean it up and you're gonna to try to make it right. Now remember, these are people who many have lost their livelihoods, many had very little way. The Jewish community was not you know, very, very uh, financially solvent at this point. And of course, the German government knew that. They knew it. If anything else, it was a symbolic pointing of the fingers. This was your fault, so you have to make good on it. And then, oh, and by the way, if you hear those people 
maybe you have, maybe you haven't, who say that, you know, the world didn't know what was happening in Germany. The world didn't know that, you know, the Jews were being picked on. The world didn't know that, you know, the, the Nazi government had these very strong anti-Jewish attitudes. Um, Kristallnacht was covered widely in the world press, including the New York Times. It was on the front page. Pictures of destruction and synagogues burning in Germany was on the front page of the New York Times the next day. So don't tell me that people didn't know. I had a long, long argument one time in my life with somebody who just would not buy into the idea. We didn't know, that was, a, we didn't know, we didn't know. Well, they knew. It was clear that they knew. I mean, the world press picked up on it immediately. So now Hitler has to hold his breath. And what do I mean by that? I'm not trying to be facetious here. Hitler was gonna hold his breath because he was waiting to see what the world would do. He was waiting to see how the world would react. That's what I mean by holding his breath. This was the first big nationwide action throughout the entire nation of Germany. Nationwide anti-Jewish pogrom, anti-Jewish action. And because he knew it was covered in the press and because he knew that you know this was now going to be broadcast out there, what was the world going to do? Were they going to react summarily against Hitler in some sort of way uh, that was going to sort of nip this in the bud or threats that were going to make his power in Germany much, much more difficult to hold on to? Um, that's what he needed to see. What were they going to do? And while there were, there were words, there certainly were words of condemnation from many nations of the world, they basically did nothing. They did nothing. Remember, isolationism was still the word in the United States. We can't get involved in their affairs. We can't get involved, that's, that's their problem. Um, England and France had their own situation still trying to recover from the Great Depression. And so nobody felt like it was their thing to get involved with. And so Hitler could stop holding his breath because most of the rest of the world did damn near next to nothing to put it quite succinctly, other than some condemnatory words here and there, you know, shame, shame on you, don't do that. You know, kind of like if I reprimand the cat, don't do that, Barry. You know, I see cat ears. <laughs> um, anyway, so, I mean, he kind of got a free pass here. He really, really did. Now, to make it look like they cared, because the world was, you know, well, we kind of got to look like we care because, you know, these people, you know, they were beaten up and, you know, they, they had their communities destroyed and they had their religious institutions destroyed. So there was a conference called in the city of Evian in France. The Evian conference, um, 32 nations attended, not Germany, of course, but 32 free nations of the world, including the United States of America, um, attended the Evian conference. It was a conference that was designed to address what was going to be the problem of Jewish refugees. We know there is going to be an influx of people wanting to leave Germany now, Jewish people wanting to leave Germany. And what are we going to do about it? How are we going to handle what is clearly going to be a Jewish refugee issue coming out of Germany. We got to discuss this. We got to figure it out as a world community. So the idea behind the Evian Conference is certainly very, very good. It's very worthwhile. When the conference is over after discussion and talking and, and whatever, and you know, I wasn't there, so I don't know what they talked about. Um, not one country, not one, not one country of the 32 that were represented was willing to relax their immigration quotas and open their doors widely to accept Jewish refugees. I guess everybody felt like it was, well, it was the other country's problem. Well, well, it's that country's problem. Well, we'll let them do it. And so nobody did it. And that includes the United States. Nobody was willing to relax immigration quotas to take people in who are going to be trying to escape Nazi Germany. It's a very sad day. 
for the world community. When you've got 32 free nations and none of them are willing to really lift a finger to do something to help what they know is coming and they know it's coming. In fact, and it's not a proud moment, a bill, two senators in the United States Congress after the Evian con conference proposed in Congress a bill to allow an additional 20,000 Jewish children, because they felt if they put it in the appeal of children, they would have a greater chance. They tried to pass a bill that it would allow 20,000 additional Jewish children beyond the quota that was already in place to find refuge in the USA. And the bill was soundly defeated in Congress. Again, not a very proud moment. So the world did nothing, sadly. The world really just didn't do anything to try to help the people who clearly were, were going to be trying to leave Germany. Um, briefly touch on the story of the St. Louis because it's pretty well known. It's been done in movies, it's been done in books and whatever, but just because it is important and it fits right here into this time frame. Uh, the St. Louis was uh, a passenger ship that set sail in May of 1939 from the Netherlands. It had 937 passengers on board, most of them Jewish. Um, they were leaving, I'm sorry, it left out of Hamburg, not the Netherlands, it left out of Hamburg, Germany, excuse me. Um, they were leaving and they, they left with certificates in hand. They weren't just going out into the vast unknown, hoping that something good would happen. They had certificates in hand landing certificates, certificates that guaranteed them the chance to leave the ship and land and take refuge in Havana, Cuba. They had those, they all had them, everybody on board. So the ship set sail, crosses the Atlantic with a German crew who were Nazis, but People who were on that ship said they were treated very well. They were treated with respect. They were treated with dignity. And they were the lucky ones because they were getting out. They were getting out. When the ship finishes its Atlantic crossing and gets to Havana, Cuba, in the meantime, the president of Cuba had a change of heart. But this was not Castro. This is pre-Castro. Um, so don't blame this on Castro. Um, he said, no, you cannot land. I don't care that you have certificates. I don't care that we told you you could land when you got here. You're not getting off the ship. You are not landing. You are not going to set foot on Cuban soil. The ship sat in Havana Harbor for six days, six days while negotiations were going on and you know talks and trying to figure out a solution and trying to change the mind of the president of Cuba. Could you please let the people land? They, they came here with the hopes and they had their certificates. They did everything the right way. They did it legally. Could you please see to it that you let them land? On the sixth day, the president of Cuba ordered the ship out of Havana Harbor. It needed to leave, it needed to go. And so it did. And where did it go? The ship began to sail up the East Coast of the United States. And as we all know, it's not a very far sail from Havana, Cuba to Miami, Florida. It's a pretty short sail. The ship got close to the border or to the shore of Florida. People on the ship could see the lights of Miami you know, Miami party town, woo -hoo. Um, And they were hoping that they might be able to get permission to land in the United States. And again, the ship was there, it kept going back and forth along the Florida coast while negotiations were going on to see if the US or somebody in the US could get permission for the ship to dock at some harbor in the US and for the people to get off the ship. And the resounding answer was again, no. The ship is ultimately forced to turn around and it sails back to Europe. 
when it gets back to Europe, some of the people, uh, Great Britain lets a few people come in, the Netherlands lets a few people come in, Belgium lets a few people come in, but a large number of them have to go back to the towns they came from. And a large number of them did not survive the Holocaust. So Cuba turned them away. The United States turned them away, even though they had done everything the right way legally and should by rights have been able to have passage and get out of Nazi territory, but they didn't, they didn't. And it's, it's a sad story. Um, now to address the question, I get this question whenever I've done Holocaust classes, whether I've done them with students or adults or whatever, you know, the question, well, why didn't they just all leave? Why did they all go? I mean, why didn't they just get out? They knew what was coming. They could see the handwriting on the wall. Well, I think I've kind of answered that question, but let me quickly explain a couple of things. Some who were lucky enough, and mostly a lot of the lucky ones who got out were people who already had relatives living elsewhere, the United States or some other country. They didn't leave, number one, leaving by definition means you have a place to go. If you don't have a place to go, you can't leave. It would be like me saying, I'm gonna leave Savannah, but if I don't have a place to go, where am I going? I'm kind of stuck. So if you're leaving point A, where's point B? And there were really no point Bs because countries weren't taking refugees. Con countries would not let you in. Number two, as the, the later it got into the 30s, it got harder to get the proper documentation from the German government, even if you did have a place to go. You couldn't get the papers. You couldn't get the proper documentation and paperwork together to be able to get out of the country. Yes, Andrea. What was the change, do you think, in from his go on, go on, get out to the restriction of not letting them out? What was the change of heart? He do you was think already, it was because he didn't want them to get out and the word would get out? But also because he already was planning something much bigger and greater, and he didn't need them to go anymore. There were going to be other ways to deal with the issue, as we'll see next week. Um, another reason why they didn't go, leaving also means you got the funds to leave, the money. And since so many of these people did not have the funds because they had been denied their livelihoods and whatever, you know, if, again, if I want to leave Savannah and go somewhere, first I have a place to go and I can't go for free. <laughs> and if I don't have the money, I don't have the money. Yeah, question, Carol. Well, more of a comment um, that my father came from Germany in 39 and um, he, he had done some research to find some distant relatives who lived in New York, but they had to be able to show that they could sponsor people coming in. So even though he came from a large family and had um, five or six siblings and his father, they would only, they only showed that they could, could sponsor two of them. So as a result, a number of his siblings and his father perished, but my father and his brother came here in, in 39. Thank you for sharing that because that was part of, if you had relatives overseas or in another nation, mm -hmm. they did not want, if they were gonna bring somebody over that person to become a financial burden to the nation. Right. Right. So you could prove that you could like in your family, they could support two without the financial burden falling on the United States. Okay, well, we'll let you bring two over, but that's it. That's as far as it goes. So thank you. That, that's a very good point. Other, somebody else had a question or a comment? So, I mean, leaving sounds like just go. I mean, just go, but there's so much involved with leaving. Um, there were people who certainly were smuggled out. Of course, we all know the Von Trapps crossed the Alps and got into Switzerland at the end of The Sound of Music. And people who live in border areas oftentimes could find a way to get smuggled. And there was big business of people printing forged documentation, especially for people in border areas to get them across borders of countries where the people might have a greater chance of survival. Um, but, you know, again, that meant you had to trust some people. And a lot of people doing the forged documents were not necessarily doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They wanted to be paid. 
And in some cases, they wanted to be paid very, very handsomely for the work they were doing because it was illegal. And if you couldn't make those payments, you didn't know the right connections, you didn't know how to get in touch with the right people. Well, again, you know, maybe you were stuck. I mean, it, it just became this web of, you know, one thing after another. And the further it got into the 30s, the harder and harder it got. And the, the, the Jewish community was, was decimated because they had been forced to pay these reparations to the government. People did not have livelihoods. They did not have a way of taking care of themselves. I mean, it was just, it was, it was a pretty horrible situation. It is estimated that by the end of the 1930s, at the, at the beginning of, of Hitler's reign, the German Jewish population was just under half a million people. Um, so just under 500,000. And that by the time we're getting close to the start of World War II, um, the German Jewish population was probably more in the area of 300,000. So 200,000, did find a way somehow to get out or perhaps were already dead for various reasons. Um, but clearly, I mean, those Jews still in Germany knew that the situation was not going to get better. And if any fact, it was going to get worse, um, but now feeling very, very stuck as to where they were. So any other comments, questions about anything from today or any insights anybody would like to offer, share, say? Yes, Mark. Uh, just a reminder, Tim, when you and I were talking earlier, there's a PBS series going on this week and into next um, on the rise of uh, not Nazism. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I told you I'd forget. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and I told you I'd try to remind you. <laughs> and I'm glad you did. Yeah, PBS is doing this this series, as Mark said. It's an hour long and talks about you know the rise of the Nazi Party. Um, and PBS generally you can count on, you know, documentaries on PBS to be well done, well researched. Um, and I know personally, I have learned a great deal from documentaries on PBS. It's on uh, at nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. So, you know, you can go have a time to have something to eat. I'm just curious from those of you who are, you know, older like me, um, how many remember the 1978 miniseries Holocaust <laughs> on TV? Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, you remember the late seventies was sort of the, the golden age of the TV miniseries. We had Roots, we had others. And in 1978, it was NBC who did, I believe it was four nights, two or three hours each night, a miniseries called Holocaust. Um, and we don't want to debate whether it was good or it was bad. I mean, some people thought it was well done. Other people, saw, uh, Ellie Wiesel, who was a survivor himself, hated it, absolutely despised it. Um, it started a very young Meryl Streep. Um, anyway, it was a story of a German Jewish family and of a German family and sort of followed them through the years of, you know, Hitler coming to power. And then ultimately as things grow worse um, and a lot of the things we're talking about come up in some way, it, it's a fictionalized account um, of that. And I, it is kind of what, I mentioned it because that was sort of what really opened the doors to a bigger dialogue on the Holocaust. Oh, there had been some books, yes. Um, and there had been some movies out of Hollywood, of course, you know, Judgment at Nuremberg, The Pawnbroker were early 60s movies that dealt with Holocaust themes. But to really open the doors of a much wider, greater discussion of the Holocaust, for there to be Holocaust curriculums now in schools, um, um, high schools, in colleges, at universities, and whatever, um, that miniseries sort of really opened the floodgates. And interestingly enough, the miniseries was shown in Germany and it received widespread um, viewership. I mean, they weren't sure how it was gonna happen, but people watched it. And it opened up a big dialogue in Germany where Germany also began to deal much more openly and honestly with the issues of their own history and their own issues of the Holocaust. Um, so, I mean, the whole notion of Holocaust studies as a serious, serious, you know, academic discipline really kind of date back to uh, that period where it really got people talking um, and schools incorporating. But as I think I already told you, there are only 15 states in the United States that mandate Holocaust education. There are still 35 states that have no 
no requirement that students have to be given Holocaust education, which is really pathetic in my book. <laughs> um, anyway, anything else before I bid you adieu? Uh, next week, I realize this is Thanksgiving week. Um, if you're jetting off somewhere or, or won't be with us, um, Jennifer was able to get the YouTube up. So this one did get taped for YouTube. Um, and I'll make sure we can get next week. So if you have to miss it because of Thanksgiving um, holiday plans or whatever, I completely understand. I'm going to ask people to do homework. Um, I want everyone next time to, if you have a particular book or a couple books on the Holocaust that you would recommend to other people, um, email those titles to me. Don't, I don't wanna spend time next week discussing because next week's really big time curriculum. Um, these we've all been able to get done by eight o'clock. I think next week we're gonna go right to 8.30. Um, think about it and email me some titles. I have a Holocaust uh, bibliography that I'm going to send to everybody when this is over, but I would like to add any that I don't have that you might think are really worthwhile. So just send me a quick email with the title and author that I could add to it. Um, if it's one that you found particularly insightful or particularly moving, uh, if I don't already have it on my list, because there's so many out there, um, and I know I've not read everything, I've only touched a very small percentage. I really would appreciate hearing, you know, what is on your list. If you were going to make a recommended Holocaust reading list, what would you tell people to read? What would you recommend people to read? I would be very, so, very honored. <laughs> question. Yes. Um, do you want fiction too, or...? or just nonfiction? Anything, anything that you feel is worthwhile. If you feel the book is worthwhile mm -hmm. and will help people to a greater understanding of this very, very difficult subject, this very, very difficult time period, include it. You know, don't, don't censor it, be it fiction, nonfiction, you know, because there have been good books written on all sides of this. And, and, and also don't censor it if it's something that's maybe more geared toward a younger audience. Um, there are some great books that okay. have been written for younger audiences. Search for the stars. Yeah. yeah, number of the stars. Yes. Yeah. I used to teach that to to students way back yeah. when. Yeah. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a great book. It's a great book and engenders a lot of really good discussion with younger people. Um, so anyway, I'm just going to ask you to do that. If you forget, you forget. But if you've got one, you know, send me the title, and I'll be happy to add it to the list that I can send out to everybody um, next week as well. Okay. It's not too hard. I'm not asking you to write like a 500 word essay or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a good rest of your week and a good Shabbat this weekend. And I will look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank Take you care. so much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Take care. Stay warm. <laughs> <laughs>